Uh, we were with uh, Bill Warren on a pre-tape, and uh, I understand that uh, I made a misstatement or I had a confusion. It's been a number of weeks since I taped that show with Bill Warren. Uh, I do, in fact, know that Rochester is in New York and that George Eastman uh, founded the Eastman Rochester uh, School uh, in, uh, in Rochester, New York. I'm not a complete dolt. Also, I have not bothered to uh, look up who the writers were on Peggy Sue Got Married, but it's such a wonderful film, you must go and see it. Peggy Sue Got Married is what uh, Back to the Future tried to be, but uh, didn't have the smarts to be. And I would tell you that when I, uh, uh, Spielberg was quoted, somebody asked him why he would make a film or why he would produce a film like Back to the Future, and he said, I wanted to make the most expensive segment of Leave it to Beaver ever shot. Well, my friends... What are we to make of that? Also, Mr. Spielberg, uh, uh, with, with, with an uncommon sense of, uh, of inappropriateness, this uh, coming week's Amazing Stories is about a couple of high school kids who play a rock record backwards and summon up the devil. Now, I think that's just... I mean, we really need that a lot. Jerry Falwell doesn't have nearly enough ammunition at the moment, and we really need that. Thanks an awful lot, Steve. Uh, we're, uh, we're looking to you for leadership, kid. Tonight, here on Mike Hodel's Hour 25, with uh, my known good self, Harlan Ellison, your host, my guest will be Robert Silverberg, uh, the author of nine and a half million books, not the least of which is the latest one, Star of Gypsies, about which we'll be talking. Mr. Silverberg will be in town tomorrow to autograph that and other books. And uh, we'll be talking about, uh, about his signature. We will talk long and hard about his signature, a matter of some controversy among those of us who examine the meanings behind signatures. If I seem to be rambling, it's probably because I'm rambling. It's been one of those days. One of, one of, one of you out there wrote me and said, gee, uh, Morell was so interesting. David Morell was so interesting. Why did you have that whole half hour of babble that you did and, and Terry with that long calendar and all that trivial stuff? Well, my dear, some of it may have been trivial to you, but to us it was of burning importance. I mean, for instance, here's a letter that you may think is trivial, but it's from Stan Lee in Santa Barbara, and he says, Dear Mr. Ellison, you've said several times on Hour 25 that if Dan Simmons' novel Song of Kali should win the World Fantasy Award, it will be a great coup because it will be the first, first novel ever to win the World Fantasy Award. And then Stan writes down the word untrue, which means I have been lying. And he then points out that the 1985 award for best novel was shared by Rob uh, Holdstock's Mythigo Wood and Bridge of Birds. Bridge of Birds by Barry Huart uh, is a first novel and a wonderful one. Well, now you see, this, is, uh, this was not an, a lie on my part. I simply was uninformed. I somehow had, had, uh, had flensed Bridge of Birds from my mind, if in fact I ever knew that it had won. Uh, I thought Mythigo Wood had won, all by its very lonesome. And since I knew it was not uh, Rob Holdstock's first novel, I thought I was right. Well, Stan, you've... Uh, You've suitably chastised me. I feel chastened and uh, quietly humble and proud to be able to present this information. Uh, nonetheless, if, uh, if Dan Simmons wins, it will, uh, it'll be terrific. How's that? It'll be the first terrific novel ever to win. I don't know. Marty Evans from Lake Arrowhead sends in a note and says, Mr. Ellison. Boy, that always gets me nervous, Mr. Ellison. Mr. Ellison was my father. He died in 49. He can just call me, I don't know, dimwit. Mr. Ellison, how about the address for Fundamentalists Anonymous? A lady friend of mine who's a psychotherapist needs it bad. You mean badly. Also, next Halloween, not this one, could your Hour 25 do its own version of the War of the Worlds? No. One more request. Read, please, Phyllis Gottlieb's Cracker Jack short story, Fuff Aleph? You have strange printing. Anyhow, it's a, it's a Phyllis Gottlieb story. Uh, Marty says I'm doing good work. Uh, I may or may not read the Phyllis Gottlieb story. I don't know. Whatever catches my fancy. But I can satisfy you, yes, I can satisfy you, on the address for Fundamentalist Anonymous, because I happen to have it right in front of me. For those of you who wish to have the address of Fundamentalist Anonymous, uh, whose slogan is, there is a way out, the address is Fundamentalists Anonymous, Post Office Box 20324, 20324 Greeley Square Station that's Greeley as in Horace G-R-E-E-L-E-Y Greeley Square Station New York, New York 1 
0001-9992. Now in Southern, Southern California, there's a Fundamentalist Anonymous um, division, department, arm, leg thing here. But I can't find that address unless I look long and hard. Um, I got here even a Fundamentalist n Anonymous newsletter. Uh, they put out a newsletter. We're going to have someone on here uh, after, a, uh, you know, in, 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 a, in a few weeks to do that. I've been trying to book ahead as much as I can. Uh, why don't you use the New York address for your uh, psychiatrist lady friend? And for anyone who wants to get out of uh, fundamentalism, I guess that address will work for you, too. There is a Southern California adjunct, but I don't, I'm sorry to say, have the address in front of me. I thought I did have it, but uh, I do not. But that's Post Office Box uh, 20324, Greeley Square Station, New York, New York, 10001-9992. This is all very much on my mind today, of course, because uh, the Scopes 2 trial uh, ended today, and uh, amazingly enough, the seven families prevailed. Bert was pointing out to me, <coughs> that's Bert Handelsman, DE, Demon Engineer, who was on the board as our usual uh, engineer tonight. Bert was pointing out to me that uh, they uh, are going to try and include the three little pigs in, uh, in this because apparently uh, when the three little pigs dance around in a circle that is a sort of demonic witch dance um, I understand the ACLU and people for the American way and the state of Tennessee are going to be appealing this uh, decision they must they must of course it would be chaos in the schools if this were left to stand in any case uh, I'm a little saddened by that particularly since next week uh, I will not be live. I will be on tape next week, and I'm going to be in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, where they rioted when Ruth Westheimer, Dr. Ruth, came to speak. Uh, something interesting happened. I got a call from uh, a student at the University of uh, North Carolina in Greensboro who said that when he went to buy a ticket for my lecture, he was told by the very clean young woman in the ticket booth that there wouldn't be any tickets available because uh, Ellison was canceling out when, of course, no such thing is the case. And uh, he called to let me know, and we went back through the, uh, um, the office of uh, the president of the university and said, would you check into this? And they found out that the young woman was a fundamentalist, a born-again, and had been informed that the Antichrist was coming to speak at the school and that she must do something. And so she was telling people not to buy tickets because I wasn't going to be there. Now, I wonder how that Christian lady reconciles telling a lie with her beliefs. Well, I suppose extremism in the defense of uh, whatever is no crime. Hmm? Okay. Um, Glenn Silberberg, no relation to Robert Silverberg, sends me a postcard from Pasadena saying, Dear Harlan, I hope you will continue the practice of having a program in December or January to discuss the noteworthy speculative fiction of 1986. Well, Glenn, I... I may not, um, because it would entail me reading an awful lot more of the stuff than I can stomach. Uh, I read as much of it as I can possibly bear, and I try to turn you on to the good stuff as, I, as it comes uh, past me, but would you believe that I actually have a life outside of this program? And uh, to read all of the stuff that would be noteworthy uh, would be very difficult for me. So I don't think that's in the cards, but what the hell, we're giving you a lot of other really good stuff. We're trying to keep things entertaining. Uh, the diversity of uh, topics that we try to get on here uh, seem to be pleasing most people. We've lost a few, but uh, we've gained something like 40,000 listeners. Yes, our legions are massive now. Sorry, Glenn. But I'll tell you one book to look forward to. Actually, I'll tell you two books to look forward to because I think they're going to be Hugo and Nebula contenders for next year. Oddly enough, both of them come from Bantam, I guess. Well, no, one of them is coming from Arbor House. It's a hardcover by, uh, uh, we published, I think, in January, by George Alec Effinger called When Gravity Fails. If there's going to be a better book than that next year, it's going to have to be very good indeed. The other one that I recommend is Connie Willis's forthcoming novel from Bantam called Lincoln's Dreams, and it is a toad strangler. I've been reading it in manuscript form. They wanted a blurb, and I must tell you that it's just about as good a book as I've read in a long time. 
Maybe I should tell you who's coming up in the weeks to come. Oh, why not? Next week, Halloween, Sex in the Seance Room with David Alexander of the Southern California Skeptics and D. Scott Rogo, who is a consultant for Fate Magazine. He's the author of the book, Phone Calls from the Dead. Mr. Rogo uh, says that he is a psychic researcher. That's the title he likes. And we had a wonderful show, which we taped. Uh, we taped it on October 13th. And um, uh, Jeff Bickle was our engineer, a swell guy. Uh, if we can't get Bert, we like Bickle. Give us Bert or Bickle. November 7th, we got Dan Simmons, the author of Song of Kali. He will be here the week after the World Fantasy Awards, and we may be talking to the 1986 winner of the best fantasy novel. Although it's not really fantasy, but they don't know that. But it's so good that it jumps the categories. November 14th, Linda Strawn Bove will do a two-hour future watch, because I will be, for most of the month, in New York, being sued for libel. November 21st, Somtau Sosharitkul's SF Music Show. We've talked about this before. We've told you about it. Somtau got in touch with us the other day. He's got loads and loads of music taped. Uh, each piece of music, you'll get three bars, no more. It'll be a very strange show. November 28th, on a pre-tape, with Greg Bear. Uh, we just noticed that we just stopped by uh, a bookstore that I, I won't mention. Uh, actually, it's the one that I could mention if I wanted to mention it, but I won't mention it because if I mention that one, then I have to mention the one that I won't mention. And uh, so that's not fair because the FCC says if you're not going to mention the one, then you can't mention the other. Well, you understand what I'm talking about. Anyhow, Greg Bear will be here. His new book is out. It's called The Serpent Mage. And uh, Eon and Blood Music are all wonderful books. He's a fascinating speaker. December 5th. If uh, the creek don't rise, I will be back from New York. And uh, Phil Folio, or Foglio, I always get it wrong. Phil always tells me how to pronounce it. I always mispronounce it. It's either Folio or Foglio, uh, who is uh, doing the Rick Raygun comic now and who did the uh, Bob Aspirin Myth Adventures comic for, for so long. Uh, Phil will be here, and he's one funny guy. There will also be a future watch on that night. December 12th, Harry Harrison. Yes, yes, Harry Harrison in the flesh. Bones, flesh, marrow, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I don't know what I'm going to do on December 19th, but I'll tell you, I, Roy Hooper, dear, dear Roy Hooper, who sends us cassettes of old-time radio shows, has sent me some stuff that is just wonderful. He sent me, from 1951, Pete Kelly's Blues with Jack Webb as the uh, jazz musician with Beth C. Smith singing on it. And it was, and we, Susan and I listened to it the other night. Was, it was just a knockout. And I thought, boy, I'll bet you they'd like to hear this. Also, uh, um, uh, NPR, National Public Radio, did um, some readings, some, some dramatizations of Lovecraft a few years back. And uh, one of them is The Rats in the Walls. And I listened to that one, and that one knocked me out. And then, we, then we, there were some escapes that he sent me. He sent me uh, uh, tapes from Escape and ta a, a Quiet, Please, that will blow you away. And I thought maybe, maybe I would just do a show of these wonderful old radio shows for you. I don't know. When we open the phones later on, tell me how, if you'd like that. And also, I kind of like to do a show where we just sit and talk to each other, where we rap with the group mind. I haven't done that in a while. And, you know, I just long to know what your every innermost thought is and... Uh, I know you'd like to talk to me, so maybe we'll do that part, part way through December. We'll see. In January, on January 2nd, we haven't got anything yet, but January 9th, we got Peter Beagle. Peter S. Beagle, his first novel in 10 years will be out, and Peter Beagle, who wrote The Last Unicorn, will be here. And on January 30th, the author of When Gravity Fails, who, about which I spoke a moment ago, George Alec Effinger will be here. We're bringing him in from New Orleans, and uh, George will be here to talk to us about uh, his writing. And that's what we've got coming up. You'll see all of these things in your folio, your KPFK folio, if in fact you have joined up and have sent in money to the station, as you certainly should have, because we know you care about the station. My, my program notes are rich and enlightening, humorous to a fault. Now, somebody said, don't go on too long tonight, so I'm only going to go on for about, about 20 minutes instead of 30, and Terry's going to do a calendar, maximum 10 minutes, maybe 7.5, 7.5, we'll see. Remember a long time ago, a nice lady from Mojave named Pauline Blewett sent me a letter and said, uh, you know, stop taking the name of you-know-who in vain, and I gave her a hard time. Well, she's still listening, and that, that's okay. I like, I like Pauline Blewett a lot. Pauline Blewett uh, sent a letter 
about David Morrell and the whole thing about the Catholic Church. And she did this whole number about the papacy. And uh, uh, I called David Morrell because I don't understand any of this stuff. I mean, you know, as a renegade Jew atheist... Uh, uh, communist uh, nigger lover, you know, whatever it is they call me when I go out and speak, uh, those, all of those things. I didn't understand some of it, but I fed it to him, Pauline, and he said that the... Uh, <laughs> now, let me make sure I get this right. This is going to be wonderful because nobody's going to know what I'm talking about. The Second Vatican Council did, in fact, change over from the Thomistic to the Augustinian, which is... Uh, the uh, is, uh, uh, Thomas is, 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 is after Aquinas, and Augustinian is... St. August Aquinas or something. I don't know. Anyhow, the one believes that um, the real body and the real blood, transubstantiation, were what happens when you take the wafer, whereas the Augustinian philosophy is that it is all symbolic. So uh, uh, what you said about that, it's only, um, it was only the public, uh, uh, the, express, uh, the, the, uh, the Catholic belief expressed ritually, it was public worship only. Apparently, uh, Morel disagrees with you. Now, I, look, kid, don't get me involved. I don't know the first thing about it. Um, I would forward your letter to him, but I said, David, may I forward this to you? He said, hell no. So, <laughs> so Pauline, I'm sorry. I did my best, kid. Um, David Dougal. David Dougal. I love that name. David Dougal. David Dougal sent me a very large postcard, uh, which is obviously a photograph by David Dougal of Full Moon Over 6th Street, a rare glimpse of Earth's only known moon seen vainly trying to hide behind clouds and local scenery in Long Beach. Though its habits are well known to astronomers, this shy heavenly body appears in this shape only once monthly. Uh, David Dougal says, Seeing how Ronnie avoided eliminating our nukes over the past weekend, I'm interested in both your views on the summit and how this impacts on, quote, Ellison's last theorem, Trust me, folks, they won't have a nuclear war, which you've promised to talk about, but you never mentioned on your list of upcoming programs. Now, Dave, the reason I haven't mentioned it is because I haven't put it together yet, because I want to get a scientist in here who can say, Ellison, you're stuffed full of wild blueberry muffins and explain why, or say you're absolutely right, or, gee, that sounds right. Now, I got this theorem. We're not going to have a nuclear war. I keep telling you this. We're going to be okay. you got to trust me on this one until we do the program, and I'm going to do the program as soon as I can, and when we get things together here, but I got to get an authority. If somebody out there knows someone with unassailable credentials like Carl Sagan or something, well, I know Carl Sagan. Why don't I get Carl? Because Carl's too busy to come. That's what, all right. Anyhow, this one is important. This one is very, very, very important. Uh, for those of you particularly living in the 57th Assembly District, this is a letter from Bill Thompson in Los Alamitos who said, Dear Mr. Ellison, these two, he sent me some clippings. And he said, these two letters appeared in the Long Beach Independent Press-Telegram and were written by the Republican candidate for the Assembly in the 57th District. And that person's name is Claire E. Barnes of Long Beach, apparently. And he says in the letter, I'm certain that any Hour 25 listeners who live in that district will want to hear Ms. Barnes' opinions and remember them on Election Day. The first letter is Ms. Barnes' explanation of some rowdiness. Now, let me, let me get these in, in order here. Um, okay, the first one is, oh dear, I had them in order, now why are they out of order? Well, here's the piece from the, from the, from the newspaper. Uh, oh wait, oh no, I got it, I got it, I got it. The first letter is Ms. Barnes' explanation of some rowdiness at San Pedro High School. The students hooped it up during the graduation exercises and the principal stopped the ceremony. For some reason, Ms. Barnes was unhappy with the students' behavior but not with the principal's action. And here's her letter that was in the, uh, this is uh, 25 June, 86, in the, uh, uh, the Long Beach uh, Independent Press-Telegram. And this is a letter from Claire Barnes. And she says, What do we expect when biblical morality is replaced with situation ethics, when prayer is forbidden, but Dungeons and Dragons, a derivation of witchcraft, is permitted? I have heard of teachers bringing witchcraft devices into the classroom. We should expect misbehavior when young people are taught in situation ethics classes to disrespect authority. The U.S. Constitution guarantees that the Congress shall pass no law that prohibits the free exercise of religion. So why do we allow anyone else to restrict our freedom while they brainwash our kids? I wonder if anybody should point out to her that many people do follow witchcraft as a religion, and I guess they're entitled to do it too. In fact, maybe we should do a show on here uh, around the time of the Yule with witches. 
That would really fry Claire Barnes' uh, cajones, wouldn't it? Wait a minute, cacahuates. Cacahuates are peanuts. That's, that's, a, that's an acceptable word. Um, so now we go on to the second letter from, uh, 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 from Claire Barnes, and it is in response to a piece that appears by Dorothy Korber in the press telegram about... Well, I'll, read you, I'll just read it to you. This is from the uh, 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 Long Beach Independent Press Telegram of September 30th. It says, Teacher's Guide Rekindles Age-Old Controversy. Science writer livid over religious inferences. I think what they mean is apoplectic. Livid would be white, as we know. They, they misuse the word. By Dorothy Korber. It says, A teacher's guide written by a trio of professors, two of them from California State University, Long Beach, has rekindled the evolution versus creationism controversy in the state's educational system. The guide and a related booklet, both prepared for the State Department of Education in 1985, are in draft form, according to the department, and both contain the same misinformation about evolutionary theory, according to San Francisco science writer William Bonetta. Bonetta was sent the two drafts, which discussed the issue of heredity and birth disorders, by a pediatrician friend who had been asked to review them by the state. Bonetta criticizes as inaccurate the document's description of Darwin's theory and definitions of natural selection and evolution, but mostly he's incensed that the guide and booklet advise teachers to balance their teaching of evolution with explanations of, quote, other theories of the origin of living things. Bonetta, a leader in an effort last year to make California biology textbooks measure up to scientific standards, flew into action earlier this month, sending out a flurry of letters and photocopies demanding changes in the drafts. Quote, in the context at hand, other theories is the current and unmistakable euphemism for religious myths, Panetta wrote in an outraged letter to Tom uh, Sachs, head of the state's mathematics and science education unit. And balanced instruction is the current and unmistakable euphemism for presenting religious myths besides scientific inferences, giving them equal time and leading children to believe that myths and scientific inferences are comparable and interchangeable. The authors, he charged, are peddling traditional creationist rubbish. Panetta then enlisted paleontologist Kevin Padian and biophysicist Tom Jukes, both professors at UC Berkeley, to write similar letters. The Teacher's Guide, Prevention of Genetic and Birth Disorders, a six-day teaching plan, was written by two health professors at CSULB, Linda Burhan Stipanoff and Kathleen Kozer, and an education professor at CSU Northridge, Susan Giratano. The other draft publication, a teacher's resource booklet called Heredity and Birth Disorders, begins with a preface by State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Bill Honig. Spokesmen for Honig and the Department of Education say they don't know who exactly wrote those comments on evolution or why. But Burhan Stepanov, Kozer, and Giratano aren't going to take the rap. Quote, the draft you obtained is not the one we wrote, Giratano said in a recent interview. Burhan Stepanov is out of town and Kozer was also unavailable. The teaching strategy is, what, strategy is what we wrote, and that was rewritten by someone else. We had nothing to do with the comments on Darwin or evolution. She said she was amazed when Bonetta wrote her to criticize the teaching guide she and her co-authors produced two years ago. I can't believe this situation, Giratano said. It's quite amazing. Sachs is more perturbed than amazed by Benetta's complaints, he said in a telephone interview from Sacramento. We know there are problems in these publications. That's why we sent them out to be reviewed, Sachs said. We were the ones who sent them out to have the problems identified, and now we're being lambasted for it. Sachs said the two drafts were generated. I love that word. They were generated by the Department of Education's health staff at a time when that unit operated independently of Sachs' math and science unit. Now we're much more collaborative in our reviews of department material, Sachs said. Amanda Mellinger, the newly appointed head of the health unit, said both of the documents were written before her arrival. They're old, actually, Mellinger said. Those documents have been lying around here, and we decided to get some feedback. Should we revise them or throw them away? The State Department's stand on evolution in textbooks is certainly a strong one, and we won't publish anything that weakens it. This controversy can only hurt the goodwill this department is trying to build. Bonetta said he was well aware that the documents were drafts. It seemed not merely appropriate, but quite necessary to catch this matter while the documents were still in drafts, he said. But I'm somewhat puzzled by the statement that these drafts are old. Both are dated in 1985. But that's a minor point. What is important is this, that the drafts be corrected and each be equipped with a forthright, scientifically valid, contemporary explanation of evolution and of the intimate and necessary connection between evolutionary biology and genetics. That, said Tom Sachs, is exactly what the Department of Education wants. Quote, in the next few weeks, we will engage a noted biologist to redraft these publications, probably someone nominated by Kevin Patty, and he said, we're going to get that material fixed up. Now, in response to this article, and this is what all of that was in aid of, here is the letter from Claire E. Barnes, 
who labels herself the president of the Salt of the Earth Association in Long Beach, and she is apparently running as a Republican candidate for the Assembly in the 57th District. And here is her response to what I've just read you, and it's a letter to the Long Beach Independent Press-Telegram. And I'm going to read it with a funny voice. How can William Bonetta be called a science writer? On page B1 of the September 30 edition of the Press-Telegram, in an article written by Dorothy Corber, Mr. Bonetta lets go with a religious vendetta against the Bible in referring to the truth stated therein as religious myths. While strongly objecting to presenting creation as an alternative belief, he stated that children might believe that the biblical myths and scientific inferences are comparable and interchangeable. Mr. Bonetta cannot be a scientist since he violates the first principle of science in that he refuses to be objective. It is apparent that evolution is his religion and that for anyone to hold any other religion is absolutely intolerable to him. Evolution is a disproven theory and therefore a religious belief that should not be taught at taxpayers' expense. Conversely, the Bible is the most proven book that was ever written and should not be excluded from the educational processes. Although it is the basis for religions, it is not in itself a religious book. It is historically accurate, an accurate guide in almost every subject. Many scientific discoveries are a result of information gained from the Bible. Creation is so well described in the Bible that it twice states, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. Now, folks, out there in the 57th District, I present this material to you. Uh, for your edification, and you do with it uh, what you will. Uh, ours is not to tell you how to vote here on this uh, station. We feel you should vote uh, with as much information as possible. And so we read you the letters from Ms. Barnes and uh, the item from the newspaper, and uh, we leave it up to you. That's the 57th uh, Assembly District. The, the writer was Claire Barnes, and um, uh, we thank Bill Thompson for sending that along. There's a lot of interesting things coming up that we're going to be voting on. We want to uh, be very careful we all vote. We want to be very careful that we all look at everything that needs to be examined in this election. There are some very dangerous and some very interesting um, propositions. Also, we would like to, uh, I mean, personally, my personal feeling is that we should support the justices. That it's going to be necessary for everybody who cares to get out there and vote yes to retain the justices. If you feel otherwise, of course, you should vote no, but that's... Uh, if you don't have an opinion, look into it, check the record, and let's see if we can keep the judiciary uh, independent. Right now, I would like to keep uh, the show independent by giving you the calendar with our producer, Terry Hodell, in the Starscape, and then I'll be right back with Robert Silverberg in a fascinating discussion. So Silverberg walks in after I... After I read the piece about the uh, the crazy lady uh, in the assembly district, he says, boy, that was boring. What a stiff that was. So I, I want to play something for you that is not boring right now. Bob, I want you to listen to this because this I found on my answering machine. This is the kind of stuff that I get. Now, folks, group mine, I want you to listen. Uh, I want you to listen to this. This is, see if you recognize the voice. If you do, please someone call in and tell me who it is. This was on my telephone answering machine last week. Bert, would you hit the tape? I like your answering machine message. I really do. It's very original. People say that I have a voice like yours, and I deny that emphatically because I'm a member of the Radicals. And the Radicals are, of course, the uh, people's front for uh, anti-reality. You write too much like reality. I'd like to tell you that, but I couldn't get past your secretary the first time. Uh, you used to work for the uh, Los Angeles Free Press, right? They got bombed? That was us. Yeah, yeah, you were writing too much about reality then. Then we were the people's front against fantasy. But uh, now we've changed, and now that you've written fantasy and so on and so forth, um, we're going to have to take care of you. You could probably try and reach me. Nah, I wouldn't want you to get in touch with me. I'll get in touch with you. He says he's going to take care of you. Oh, he says he, he says he bombed the LA Weekly, uh, the the no, Free he said, Press. He said they free, got bombed. No, no, no. He said he said you were bombed at the uh, when you worked for the Free Press. That was us. He says we're going to have to take care of you. Now that is what is called a death threat. Now, first of all, it came over the telephone wires, so that makes it a federal offense. Second of all, I know this is a this is this is a fan of some sort, a, a science yeah, fiction it reader. Science fiction it has a science fiction voice, that wimpy kind of you know silly voice but I would love to know who it is now the, a person like this must must have a voice that someone will recognize our number here is 818-985-KPFK 
818-985-KPFK. If you recognize that voice, do give me a call. What was that, the People's Front Against Reality? Well, first they were the People's Front Against Reality, and then the People's Front Against Fantasy. When that I was writing, all I wrote too much reality, now I write too much fantasy, and this person is going to get me. Now, the race is to see whether this person gets me before I get this person. Gee, I was ready to come in here and get you as you went on and on about that poor dumb lady who, who was afraid of Dungeons and Dragons. They don't even know who you are. I haven't even announced you. Oh, go yet. ahead. Let no, me. I may not even announce you to hell with you. I mean, I'll let them not know who you are. Right, I'll tell them who I am. <laughs> if you knew who you were... I wouldn't be here. You wouldn't right. be here. My guest tonight is Robert Silverberg, uh, whom I will call Bob, but you may not do so on pain of death. He, he hates it. He likes, Actually, being, no, no, he likes being called Robert. Robert is what he prefers. Uh, Bobbo. Bobbo you, is a you, good You scoundrel. You, <laughs> you miniature punk. <laughs> Mr. Don't, Silverberg don't descend immediately to this guy's scurrility. Mr. Silverberg is the author of a number of books, the titles of almost all of which escape me at the moment, with the exception of a new Your audience is escaping you even as you do this. They love this. They like hearing the conversations they that I have. They went away half an hour ago. I've known you... Telling them about your January years? 8th program. How many years have I known about you? About a year and a half. I've known you how many years? Try to, try to be civil. Well, let's see, 1492... It's going on, it's over 30 years. Yeah, We've known each other well over 30, 30 years. years. Much too much. There are no insults we have left for each other. We are very different people, as we discovered over dinner again, as usual. You did something tonight that I don't think you've done in, in 35 years, though. What's that? You bored me. I bored you? Yeah. When was that? Uh, as you were doing your monologue. Did I bore you as much as you bored Karen by making her sit through five hours of Der Singer last night? The woman is dead asleep on the sofa. Vog the Wagner bored her. I, she just accompanied me voluntarily. Wagner has bored entire nations, <laughs> and you made her sit through Wagner, and you have the audacity, the temerity, the chutzpah to come in here and say that my attempting to save the world from this lunatic out in Long Beach is boring? Feh, sir. Feh, I say to you. Tell us about your new dumb book, Star of Gypsies. Go ahead. My new uh, robust, earthy, and vastly entertaining book? Is that the one you mean? <laughs> Star of Gypsies, which, which I will be flagrantly autographing tomorrow at Dangerous Visions in A Change of Hobbit to a large audience of uh, eager, passionate readers. I advise everyone to stay away from these two <laughs> events in droves. It can only hurt your immortal soul to go to such a thing. Yeah, well, those people, of course, who are not going to be at the, the Clara Barnes rally in Long Beach are probably <laughs> going to be at the... <laughs> The store, the People's League Against Dungeons and Dragons, is is sending a bus. Uh, this book is the the memoirs of the King of the Gypsies, A.D. 3172, 179 years old, perhaps, and retired, abdicated. Who uh, the Gypsies have led everybody off to space. Uh, the the Rom, the Romani, the Gypsies. That's the the, the, the the before after they pick their pockets. Oh, they don't do that. That's that's all Goyesha rumor. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, the 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 Rom are wanderers, are travelers. They've been traveling a very long time. They are in fact extraterrestrials, which may get me in trouble with the Gypsy Anti Defamation League, if not the fundamentalists. Oh, I won't get in any trouble with the fundamentalists. We, we, I have it worked out with them. But uh, anyway, the old king tells his story, and it's a long, funny story, and I had a lot of long fun writing it. It's published by Donald I. Fine, Inc., yeah. and I understand this is your last book with Mr. Fine. Uh, yeah, we seem to have come to a parting of the ways, more or less amicably, and I'll be with, with Warner Books in the hereafter. Uh, but anyway, Don Fine has done his usual handsome job of bookmaking. It's a large hardcover book with a blue jacket and good, good-looking book, which I forgot yeah, to bring along. Yeah, tonight. he does. He does do a nice-looking book. And uh, is it a warm and human book? Oh, it's more than human. Well, you're more than human. Mm, good. That was that was good. It's, you, it's you are, an earthy and robust book. I said that five minutes ago. We can play that tape back. And when we, I'd like to hear your death threat again later on when we get tired of talking about my book. You, li I, you like that death threat? Well, I'm not sure it was a death threat. I, I think If someone says we bombed you and we're going to do it again, isn't that a death threat? Now, I grant you it's a silly person, they, and they undoubtedly are not going to bomb any damn it body. Sounded, but they it sounded like a fan-type person... Trying to shoot off you. his mouth. Yeah. You know, of course, that the, the, when I worked for the Free Press, it was bombed, and they did try to lure me down there. Do you know about that? 
No. What happened was one night I'm sitting at dinner. This is when I was doing my column for the uh, for, uh, uh, the glass tit for the, uh, the L.A. Free Press. We're having dinner, and the phone rings, and a guy gets on, and he says, this is Lieutenant somebody or other from the LAPD. And I say, yes. And he says, there's just been a bombing at the uh, Free Press offices. And uh, we uh, went in. They bombed the, the, the back door. It was blown off. And they bombed the place, and we've gone inside, and we're looking around in the card file to find someone to come down here because the place is standing open, and we need someone to watch it. And we found your name and your number, and immediately I knew it was a hype. And I said, "Wait a minute!" I said, "I said I write a column in there." I said, well, "My name wouldn't be hanging around in card files, and you wouldn't call me. You would call the." I said, "I don't know who you are, but you know, put it up your nose." And I uh, and I hung up. Uh, a half an hour later, or an hour later, the bomb went off. The second bomb? There oh, was no the oh, the first bomb. The first bomb. There was only one bomb. In other words, Ellison come down and stand by the back door <laughs> and boom, get a bomb in the face. Um, that was one of the two bomb uh, things that happened to me. Uh, and uh, so uh, I take this uh, very seriously, even if the person is playing. I intend not well, to you play. Well, you should take it seriously, although uh, maybe I wasn't paying the closest possible attention. As it went by, it seemed to me that it was not an explicit threat. He said, we're going to get you. Well... I think that's probably... So we're going to take care of you. Oh, yes, I'm And God knows you need a lot of that. Taking care of... Well, you've been taking care of me for years. I'm trying. I'm trying. What what is the nature of our relationship? I mean, the the clicking you hear, folks, is, is, by the way, not a crazed cricket. It's me trying to get my lighter lit to smoke my pipe. What what is our relationship, Bob? I mean, are are you a younger brother, older brother, sibling, father figure? How do you perceive Uh, uh, yourself? uh, About all of the above, Mm -hmm. uh, depending on the circumstances of the moment. But generally... Kind of an aching Siamese twin, <laughs> feeling a, a throb in the uh, goiter, the, the 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 union, thinking, how did I get attached here? How did how did this happen? Well, I know how we got attached. We got attached uh, in Philadelphia. Phil- that's not how. That's where. Ah, uh, that, that's not even a why. That's just a, a where. Yes, I remember Philadelphia. I want to. There's a he bug. Ju- in, he just took life. There's a there's a there's a bug in this. Uh, the in holy this man room. here, and it's uh, the holy man here has has a. Yeah, I'm really to holy. If fair. I get a hold of that person who was on the uh, on my answering machine, believe me, uh, there'll be holes. Ah. I want to I want to ask you a difficult question. I've been saving it up um, for 35 years. No, 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 no. And uh, you lost. You lost to Roger Zelazny, a story that was in uh, Asimov's magazine. I guess the month after the story for which you were nominated, Sailing to Byzantium, yep. was 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 uh, published. And I was looking back at you. You were in the row right behind me, and I was carefully watching you because, correct me if I'm wrong, you had been, you had lost Hugo's 21 times prior to this convention. Well, it's it's both a beautiful and an ugly achievement. I have been nominated... More than anyone For more else. Hugos than any other writer in the history of science fiction. Unfortunately, on all but one of those occasions, I've lost the, the Hugos. So I've also lost more nominations than right. anyone else. Now, I looked at you when they called Roger's name, and I haven't read Roger's story, but I had read yours, and yours was a marvelous story. I feel the ending perhaps could have been strengthened a little, but it was, it was a, an estimable piece of work. And I looked at your face, and you were... Uh, well, distraught is not the word. You were furious, you were angry, you were disappointed, you were saddened, you were hurt. You were in considerable pain and mm-hmm. agony. And I want to talk to you about that. I want to talk to you about your feelings, about being a writer so important that you have been nominated more than anybody else who also feels in some way overlooked in some no, way. No, I don't feel overlooked at all. Uh, well, well, then what is it? What is the feeling? Remember, the story we're talking about here, first of all, Lost the Hugo turns out by four votes, which is not a statistically s- significant amount, uh, and won the Nebula only a few months before. Uh, not a trivial achievement. The Nebula is handed out by the writers. The Hugo is handed out by a much larger electorate that's made up mainly of readers. Which do you value more? Uh, I re- don't really value either of them a whole lot. What I value is the work. The story is written. Uh, I think the ending is fine. I think the story is the best work that was in me, and that's what I value. However, it's a lot of fun to win the awards. It feels really good. Uh, it has some commercial value. 
Uh, I like winning the awards. I like winning, basically. This is not an unusual phenomenon, I think. Uh, I don't feel overlooked at all. I've earned my living in this field and a very handsome living for 30 odd years. Uh, people don't give me death threats, uh, but I never? Do, never, I never got a death threat. And uh, I'm not ready for one tonight. It's, it's been a long drive today. <laughs> uh, but I get a lot of attention and a lot of strokes and, and a lot of this. I've got actually one more nebulas than anybody alive. So the writers at least know what I'm doing. But my feeling about uh, the Yugo ceremony this last time around, I didn't think I was going to win, although I suspected a different story would win. Just sort of disgust and resignation. Uh, well, you were, you were at one point considering withdrawing from the, from the awards. Well, you? not for more than 30 seconds or so. Uh, just that I, it gets tiresome each year. The, the Yugo ceremony is a big party, and very often I preside over the party. I've been the master of ceremonies half a dozen times, and then it's my job to hand a lot of awards out to other people. It sort of spoils the evening to lose all the time, to be that consistent that I get nominated all the time. And according to this, this batch of statistics that Mike Glyer of uh, L.A. came up with, uh, I was nominated, I was on the ballot there 10 years in a row between 1967 and 76, which is something that nobody else has ever remotely achieved. Well, of course, I lost all those 10 years in a row except for Nightwings in the middle. It, it's just a dreary experience. Uh, many times... Bob, I haven't even been nominated for 10 years. Well, you didn't write a lot during some of that time, but regardless of that, now we're not talking about your experience now. Uh, and during a lot of those 10 years, you picked up an award or two. Uh, you feel eventually the writers, of course, have taken care of me, but the readers, I would, I would like to be able to please the readers. That's what a professional writer's job is while still doing something that I respect. And when you don't win the Hugo, what they're saying to you is, well, you, you went in some other direction. Well, let me ask you something. The one time that you tried to please the readers with the, uh, the Lord Valentine books, I mean, we've talked about this, and they're not among your favorite books. They're not among my least favorite books either, well, but I know what you're saying. They're not, I mean, we're not talking about books like Born with the Dead or, uh, or Up the Line or Night Wings or my favorite, which is still Thorns. Um, they, uh, the books sold very, very well. They made you a popular success. They sold mm -hmm. more than any of the other books that you had ever written. And yet, uh, you seem dissatisfied with, with, that, with that aspect of, uh, uh, of your career, too. You try to please the public. And you succeeded in pleasing the public, but somehow or other, your art seemed to be uh, compromised. What? What is it? What's what's the? Well, word? this this is a very complicated issue. I write science fiction, which is a branch of popular culture. Uh, yet, there was a long period when I approached it in a an esoteric, highfalutin way. I.e., I wrote to please myself. Uh, eventually, I had to take a long look at this and realize that if I want to continue to cover my expenses, and for reasons not entirely within my control, the expenses of my life are very high, uh, I'm going to have to back off from this, this austere, elitist position and consider the interests of the readers. During the period that I was going through this, this rethinking, unfortunately, the readers got a lot dumber on the uh, the average the audience got much larger much much larger the the science fiction audience which had been maybe a hundred thousand people hundred and fifty thousand people grew to millions and a lot of the people who came in were really undemanding folk people who wanted gentle good-natured entertainment they hadn't been as you and I had reared in science fiction and and suckled on uh, Henry Kuttner and Fritz Leiber and Theodore Sturgeon. No, they had come in from Star Wars and 
Star Trek to some degree. And they began calling the tune, as majorities do. A dumber audience was now calling the tune. A large audience, maybe not dumber, but, but certainly an audience of simpler needs than we were fulfilling. A lot of very talented writers went right out the window when this happened, just ceased to be published. I don't need to name them, but you know who they are. Yeah. Uh, I chose during this, this period of upheaval just to fall into silence and do other things for a few years. When I came back, I realized that the only way I can reestablish myself in this changed field is by changing what I write. And I did. Uh, when it came around to sailing to Byzantium last year, I thought, here, I'll do one for me. And it was recognized. It was recognized, yeah. I mean, you but only I, lost by four votes. I lost by four votes. I still had the, and it got into all the best of the year anthologies. I don't have a big grievance here, but I had the naive hope. I'm not a naive man particularly, but now and then I will have a naive hope that just this once I will sneak one by without any footnotes and, and conditions that I can write without compromising at all and get the, the large audience to say, okay, this is good enough for us, this will do, this pleases us. The Hugo is the validation of that. Did you win the Locust Poll? No. The story didn't win the Locust Poll? No. It was the same position there. It was, it was again, four votes behind. See, so I, I value the Locust Poll. Now, for, for those out there who don't know what I'm talking about, Charlie Brown publishes the newspaper of the science fiction field. It's called Locus, and they have a poll every year, and it's, well, how many... How many about a thousand people. Yeah, it's about a thousand it's, people. It's pretty it's, close overlap to the Hugos. But it's, the, but it's a much larger segment of the reading public who, who votes on the Locus poll than does on the Hugos. Well, Charlie, and, Charlie told me, I didn't pay much attention to Charlie told me that if I had bothered to vote for myself, I would have won the Locus poll with, in, with that story. But that, that, that's not the point, really. I didn't... What I felt the Hugo night was, gee, that probably came awfully close to getting me off even caring about this. I wrote a story that really pleased me. It pleased a lot of people. It pleased my fellow writers who gave me an award for it. Uh, it got into all the anthologies, and that's fine. Uh, the Hugo would, would close the account. I wouldn't have to worry about this crap anymore. I shouldn't be worrying about it. It's, it's demeaning and humiliating to be giving a damn about awards. And I didn't do it, so I remain on that hook. I didn't like it. Hmm. Well, I've, I've talked about uh, about me winning mine this time, and I was I was angry. I got angry over it. Angry at winning? Yeah, I got angry with it. I part of it was your losing. Uh, not not that I begrudge Roger, because Roger's story is a pretty good story. I haven't uh, read it, so uh, I, I, I started uh, reading it. It, it. it looked like a very, very nice piece of work. And Roger can't really write a bad story. I mean, Roger can write some that are not as good as others, but I think Roger's good, <coughs> good writer. But I, but all the things that surrounded uh, that, all the things that happened at that Hugo uh, uh, Awards ceremony, all of the little things, uh, Michael Whalen and, and, and Charlie Brown and, and, and Back to the Future winning over Brazil. I've, I've gone over this a couple of times in the last few weeks, and I really shouldn't worry it. And, and I found that when I was, when my name was called, and I looked at Susan, you know, I expected somebody else's name to be called. And when my name was called, I was, gonna say, I was about to say to her, well, there, see, they've denied it again. Well, I got it. And I went up, and I, and I found that I really couldn't say anything particularly happy because I was furious about it. Mm. And the anger did not, did not abate. Well, the whole notion of awards in the arts is, is pretty silly and beside the point, really. The, the, the award you get is the award you get from God when you do the work right. And, uh, from God, is it? Yeah, from God. Oh. Yeah. Do you have a personal relationship? Oh, yeah. We, we talk daily. He generally says, schmuck, do it right next time. Mm. And I say, I'm sorry, sir, or madam, as the case may be. As the case may be. Well... I don't know. What do you want to talk about? We usually the problem is that we usually go to dinner before we come here to KPFK ninety point seven on the FM dial in Los Angeles, Pacifica, and uh, in Los Angeles, uh, and hour twenty five. Mike Odell's hour twenty five, and Robert Silverberg and Harlan Ellison. Uh, we usually talk it all out at dinner, and it, I, I'm fascinated by the letter you got. You got your last book was called Tom O'Bedlam, and a nice book it was, but you got a couple of interesting letters, and. 
uh, repeat, if you will, for the for the group mind, the uh, of the letters that you mm, that you yeah. get. Well, we should put it in context. We were talking, actually, we were battling most of the evening and before <laughs> about your fears that the radical right is is about to dominate uh, the nation and particularly to impose censorship of all sorts. And my feeling that this is probably paranoia. Not well, yeah, paranoia in the clinical sense. Uh, probably not as serious a problem as it may look to you. I'm not a member of the radical right myself, although God knows I'm not sympathetic to a lot of the things all over the bulletin board out here, at whatever the name of this station is. KPFK 90.7 on yeah. the FM dial in Los Angeles. Yes, the other Pacific station. We have one up north where I spend my my times. KPFK up there, and I wasn't sure for a moment which, which yeah, we're one. We're KPFK is down here. Is KPFA up there? KPA. Well, KPFA. whatever it is. You you said that they should put this program on up there because mostly what they do is boring. Yeah, well, mostly what they do up there is, is grind on and on about uh, the current Berkeley issue of, of significance, which is not of a lot of significance to me. Which is getting America out of the Dominican Republic. Uh, getting it into the Dominican Republic. Oh, Republic, into the Dominican Republic. Probably. Republic. Anyway, we, we were going on about the, the radical right and, and their intrusions into everyday life. I got a letter last week uh, in relation to Tom Bedlam that began something like, Dear Mr. Silverberg, do you realize that we Christians like to read books too? Uh, fact that didn't come as news to me. A large amount of the population is Christian. I assume they like to read books. Well, apparently what I had done is have some of my rather rough and uncouth characters in Tom Bedlam say things like, Jesus, we better get out of here. And the reader took offense at that. The reader took offense at that. Well, I've learned over the years that almost anything is going to offend somebody. And if you try to write in such a way as not to offend anybody, you're going to wind up staring at your, your eyebrows most of the day. Uh, so then don't write for the audience. Well, you, no, you have to write for the audience if you expect people to, to line up and buy your books. The audience I try to write for is basically me. I figure if I can't entertain myself, I'm not going to entertain anybody else. I think you should write just for me. If you can entertain me, you can entertain anyone. Yeah, but I can't entertain you, well, any, you more, any more than you can entertain me. We're just beyond that sort of step. <laughs> um, but I can at least keep myself amused a lot of the time. And what I try to write is basically the story that I want to read. So, wait, so you didn't write back to this woman? You didn't I didn't write back to this woman because the chances are I did offend her by taking the name of her savior in vain. And I figure that's her problem. I'm not going to be able to discourage her from being troubled about this if she uh, finds it offensive that people say, Jesus, let's get out of here. She's got a lot of problems because she's going to hit that 3,000 times a day. This has moved into the language. Uh, I'm not going to apologize for it, but I'm also not going to try to convert her. The other letter that I got, either that day or the next one, also on Tom and Bedlam, referred to another little bit of colloquialism that uh, my virtually illiterate, wandering, almost psychopathic protagonist, Tom, says in response to some provocation from one of the other characters, he replies, hey, I'm not a queer. And my correspondent, who I assume without any uh, proof in the letter, is a, a sensitive young homosexual, said, this is a pejorative term that should be avoided. Uh, homosexuals are not queer, they're homosexual. Well, of course, they're not gay either, particularly, but that's a term that's, that's used. Queer is, is a fine old colloquial term used widely by homosexuals about themselves, but of course what people call themselves is not anybody's business. And this fellow thought that I was contributing to the general opprobrium heaped upon the gay population by having this, this pejorative word used. I do intend to write back to him, although whether I will is a different story. I got a lot of things that I would like to get around to doing, not much time to do it. I think he's barking up the wrong tree here. We cannot 
expect novelists to use politically correct language and expect their characters to use politically correct language all the time or any of the time uh, and to ask me to, to have my illiterate man say, oh, I'm not homosexual. I do not derive sexual pleasure from contact with the bodies of other men is silly. <laughs> uh, this fellow is just oversensitive. Well, this is the sort of letters that come in and I think the only safe and sane and useful position for writers to ignore them. Oh, absolutely. I, on the other hand, enjoy antagonizing my readers, which is why I'm not a thumping success, as are you. Uh, I, I feel that uh, I, I go with what Kafka said. Why read any book that does not thump you on the head? I mean, why bother? So I, uh, I try to uh, get as many people annoyed as possible. And it always, it always fascinates me when I'm, I'm, they, they think it's, it's an insult to say, well, you only said that to shock us. And I say, absolutely. Of course. Of course. What do you think? There are already enough people who will, who will tell you everything is okay and put your head back in the sand. Uh, I am I am here to upset you. That's what my job is. Well, there's a difference between shocking and upsetting. Well, I'm not particularly interested in shocking people. I don't like that. I don't like to be shocked myself when I read. Well, a but book. your reader was shocked by you using the word queer. He no, was he wasn't shocked. He was disappointed that so gifted and intelligent a writer <laughs> as Robert Silverberg <laughs> should be taking such a politically incorrect position. Little does he know how many politically correct incorrect positions I take. But in that case, he felt I should be helping the good fight since I don't appear to be uh, anti-homosexual myself. Uh, I should not be contributing to their problems, presumably his problems, by using this nasty word in my book. I do maintain that's a naive position. We have a number of lines jumping here. Are you interested in going yeah, to the let's, group, let's hear from to the group mine? 818-985-KPFK. We're going to open the lines now. All those angry queers. Let's hear from them. Well, <laughs> wonderful. After, after, <laughs> first I had James Elroy here about three, four weeks ago who made everybody completely crazy before the static ruined the last 20 minutes who's of the James show. Elroy? What? Who's James Elroy? James, who's James Elroy? You know, you re for someone who's supposed to know everything, you are really a yutz. I, I mentioned Jimmy Swaggart today. He said, who's Jimmy Swaggart? You don't know... Kaka from Shinola. I'm not allowed to say shit on the radio. It's, it, it's, I don't understand. Who's James Elroy? James Elroy is one of the best modern, hard-boiled writers of, of, uh, of contemporary m crime fiction. Oh. He's, he's a, a, a wonderful novelist, and, and he went all on. Right, to, all right, all right, now I know. Let's get the. He's a mad dog. And after having him, and he did sexist numbers, now you talk about those of the homosexual community as queers, puftas, fagalas. I mean, I find this offensive in the extreme. I didn't call him Fagalus. You call him Fagalus. <laughs> I don't speak that Yiddish slang of you yours. You haven't been in a shul. A in, shul? A shul in 25 That's years. That's Jewish church? That's what it is. Put the readers on. Silverberg. Here. This is already a goy name. <laughs> don't start with me. Oh, look, all the lines. All the, now, I'm warning you in advance. If you start a long, dull thing, I'm cutting your ass off. I'm not going to leave you on because we don't want to be bored tonight. Silverberg has already put us to sleep with this, this, this wearisome rotomatot of his. <laughs> Hi, you're on KPFK, Hour 25. Marvelous. Uh, Mr. Silverberg, uh, in Star of Gypsies... I know that voice. Jakob uh, sort of has somewhat the, the self-serving solipsism of uh, recent Heinlein characters. And you also at one point have what is pretty much a direct quote of uh, the opening line of Citizen of the Galaxy. And I was wondering whether the spirit of Heinlein came ghosting on you while you were writing this, whether it was a conscious thing or whether I'm just reading too much into it. No, you're reading very acutely. That was, of course, a direct quote from Citizen of the Galaxy, Lot 97, a boy mm -hmm. at the slave auction. Uh, I... I think Heinlein is one of the finest science fiction writers who ever wrote. I have some reservations about his recent books, but what the hell. Mm -hmm. And I think he's a hell of a fine storyteller, and I felt some, yes, I felt his spirit upon me in that particular book, and I acknowledged it by the direct quote, just as in a book called Downward to the Earth years ago, where Joseph Conrad was sitting over my shoulder. Horror, the horror. I acknowledged that by naming a character Kurtz and said, look here, I, I know all about the Conrad influence here, and I want you all to notice it too. Great, thank you. Do you know who you were talking to there? No. Sh you'll be seeing him tomorrow at one of the two bookstores which I will not name. That is, that is a gentleman named Bill Glass. Oh, Bill Glass, sure. Very, very fine man. Very bright man. 
Hi there, this is Mike Odell's Hour 25. I am uh, Kurtz, and sitting across from me is uh, Marlon Brando. <laughs> yes, Mr. Brando, um, as someone who's not much of a fan of the fantasy genre, but is a great fan of your science fiction works, um, what is your position as far as uh, literary content versus money and everything, as far as writing for one of the two genres more often than the other? Oh, <laughs> that's a question that squirms around all over the place. Uh, I don't much read or write fantasy, uh, which should answer the question right there. I'm, I'm a science fiction writer. Uh, I would like to... As opposed to me, who is not. <laughs> well, you're, you're defiantly non-science fiction. No, I write science fiction, basically. Uh, the Gilgamesh book a couple of years ago, I suppose, is fantasy. Uh, I would like to make as much money as possible by writing as well as I can. Uh, I don't think these are necessarily mutually exclusive goals. A guy named John Updike seems to succeed at it, and some other writers. Is there anything you would not write for money? Yeah, badly, dumbly. No, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, ex excluding that, is there any particular kind of work that you would not do for money? Well, I've written nothing but science fiction for the last 15 years, which excludes everything else. Nothing like a script for a James Cameron movie or anything like that. A James Cameron movie. I'm lost in this. He doesn't know, even world. know who James is. Please. The man has been living under a rock for 10,000 years. Uh, James Cameron uh, is, the, uh, is the screenwriter of uh, Rambo First Blood Part Two, The Exterminator, uh, uh, The Terminator, rather, the, uh, and uh, Aliens, the uh, follow-up. Okay, well, it's a lot of movies that I skipped because my impression is they were dumb, unpleasant things. Yeah, there's a lot I won't do for money, but I would like for what I do do to get paid as well as I can. This doesn't seem unnatural to me. Is, is this anything like an answer for you, sir? Absolutely. <laughs> Good. Thanks much. <laughs> okay. Hi there. You're on Hour 25 with uh, Silverberg and Ellison. Hi, Harlan. Yeah. Could you please play that tape again that was left on your machine? My boyfriend heard it and called me. It sound, The words sounded like... Someone that I may know who it is. Oh, good. I hear his voice. Bert, would you put it on right now? Listen again to the wonderful death threat message. Bert is Bert is struggling with the tape like mad. Here in the multi-million dollar Wurlitzer uh, 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 switchboard in the uh, in the in the control room. Go ahead, Bert. Hit it. I really do. It's very original. People say that I have a voice like yours, and I deny that emphatically because I'm a member of the Radicals. And the Radicals are, of course, the uh, people's front for uh, anti-reality. You write too much like reality. I'd like to tell you that, but I couldn't get past your secretary the first time. Uh, you used to work for the uh, Los Angeles Free Press, right? They got bombed? That was us. Yeah, yeah, you were writing too much about reality then. Then we were the people's front against fantasy. But uh, now we've changed, and now that you've written fantasy and so on and so forth, um, we're going to have to take care of you. You could probably try and reach me. Oh, God. You know who it is? Nah, I wouldn't want you to get in touch with me. I think it's I'll get in touch with you. a person named Johnny Ann Duffy. I don't know exactly where he lives, because I am a person on his death list myself. Oh, really? Yes. And... But I do know that ShadowCon has his address because my last run-in with him was in July at ShadowCon when he threatened my life again. Oh, well, why don't we... What, what is this guy's name? Johnny M. Duffy. Johnny M. Duffy. Yes. And uh, ShadowCon may... Uh, 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 does yes, I know they have his address. He was there. He had a badge. I reported him the incident the next day to the registration desk and... They dug out his card and made a note on it that he was dangerous. Good. I'll tell you what. I'm going to leave you on for a second. Bert, will you grab this lady's telephone number? Uh, may I call you and I'll give you uh, my address? Yes. And, and I'll call you tomorrow morning and we'll see if we can track down Johnny M. Duffy and see if we can uh, hobble uh, Mr. Duffy, okay? Okay. All right. Bert, can you get this lady? Okay. Thanks much. We're going on to the next line. Um, hi there, you're on Hour 25. I'm stunned. <laughs> um, hi, Harlan. Hi, why are you stunned? Because we just caught him? Because uh, I got on the line. Oh, oh, I thought you were stunned because we just caught a culprit. <laughs> well, 
Well, it sounded Imagine. like a friend of mine, but he's teaching English in Japan, so it couldn't be him. No, it's not. It's not. And then this, this may, if if in fact this guy threatened this woman's life, then that sounds like another interesting. I like you vigilantes saying there. We just caught a culprit. Well, you I, may have a lawsuit <laughs> from Johnny Duffy in the morning. Oh, I hope I do have a lawsuit from right, Johnny that, M. That, Duffy. I mean, if this. that's who it is. If it isn't, then I will announce on this air that it was not Johnny M. Duffy. We are scrupulous about such things. I did listen more closely this time. He did be ta- he did claim credit for the L.A. press bombing, right. and then said, "We'll take care of you." Mm. Right. Mm. Okay. Uh, I hint. Uh, all of my friends and I, uh, after the shows with Frank Miller, yeah, uh, decided that we'd really like to see Kirk Douglas play the Dark Knight in the movie. Well, he's a little old now. That's the problem. Part of the uh, reason. Oh, you mean and now? Yes, right, 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 right. The the uh, the fifty uh, fifty six year old Batman. Yeah. 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 Douglas would be perfect. Have you seen Tough Guys by any chance? No. No. Oh, I it's, seen it yet. it's a lovely film. It's mm-hmm. a lovely film. <laughs> And uh, just basically keep up the good work. And is there any possibility of seeing Robert Anton Wilson as a guest? Well, you can't see him. <laughs> I mean, it's possible. Well, on my radio, you can. Uh, listen, I, 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 Bob, Bob Wilson would be a fascinating guy to have on. And uh, uh, if uh, you know, if if we can get in touch with him, maybe we'll do that. We never really know what we're going to do, but it's uh, as you can see from the kind of guests we've had since. Since uh, Mike visited this uh, evil on me last <laughs> mid-March, we've uh, we've expanded the nature of the show. It covers all pop culture now, or we, at least we hope we try to. And uh, we're going to have a lot of surprising kind of people. But uh, Aunt Bob Bob Wilson would be a wonderful guest. Well, the whole the whole lineup sounds excellent. And uh, thanks to you both for writing excellent books. And uh, Harlan, I was just at Kmart, and there's piles of every one of your books. Um, at Kmart? Yeah, people fighting over them. Kemco oh. sell out too. Wait a minute, you're jiving me. Well, you told me to say that. I never right? told you, and I don't even know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Get off this line. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. I have no idea who that person was, and I did not tell him any such thing. About your piles? My, I don't have, Well, I... If you write for 35 years, you got to have some problems. Hello there, you're on uh, God knows what and uh, who knows where. Who is this? Oh, uh, hello, Harlan. This is Gavin Claypool. Hi, Gavin Claypool. For uh, Shadow Khan's address... If uh, that's ne- needed, you'll be able to find that on the back of the directory to Los Angeles fandom under the conventions. Thank you, Gavin. Even though it's uh, held in Los Angeles, it's apparently run by somebody out of uh, Illinois outside Chicago. Really? Yeah. Okay. Do you do you happen to know this uh, Johnny Duffy? No, I've had the uh, fortunate pleasure of never running into him before. Well, we may be, we may be we may be tiring someone who is not. Uh, let's let's let's. I don't want to jump to this. It may in fact not be Johnny M. Duffy. Uh, uh, let's let's we'll keep going and uh, we'll find out. We'll, we'll keep you apprised of this. The the uh, posse commentators will keep you informed <laughs> about what happens. But I I promise you that whoever it was who left that message on my phone, You'll get them. Their life will be from this point on, dog doo doo. Thanks much, Gavin. Okay. Now, is that a death threat or just a decomposition threat? Dog doo doo? Yeah. No, that's hyperbole, which we play in the hyperbole, epitome. Yeah. We play it in the epitome. Hi there. Hi, I just turned off the radio just a second. Uh, Harlan? Yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about a story of yours that you wrote quite a while ago called Pretty Mag- Maggie Money Eyes. I know it well. Uh... You really nailed the compulsive gambler and especially the compulsive loser in that story. And I wonder if that's exactly what you had in mind when you did it. Well, if I did that, it was, uh, it was an ancillary uh, matter. What, what happened was that I, I wrote that story, I began that story actually in Las Vegas. When I first came out here, I was working at MGM and I met a, an absolutely lovely woman and she danced in the line at the Sands. Her mother worked as a secretary at the man from uncle yeah and uh so i wound up going to vegas an awful lot and i found uh a very strange thing that i'm incredibly lucky i never lost when i gamble i never lose and so i stopped doing it it got me very scared and i have not gambled uh in no 20 years yeah and, and i didn't go back to vegas and i started writing that story um i started writing that story when i was sent to Vegas for a premiere of the Oscar, a movie that I had something to do with, and uh, 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 I started writing it in the room, and the air conditioning gave me uh, pneumonia or whatever it was, and I wound up in a hospital and finished writing it there. Uh, it, 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 it was my view of a very scary town. Yeah, well, it is, it is a very scary town. I haven't been there since 69, and I... Are you a compulsive gambler? I am a compulsive gambler. I've been in Gamblers Anonymous since 1981. Yeah. How you doing? You see, you, 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 have you dried out? Clean 
writing for three years. Good man. All right, listen, I'm going to move on so we can get somebody to talk to Bob about it. He gets, he gets very, very cranky if you don't talk about him all the time. You know. Gotcha, gotcha. Right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hi, you're on Hour 25 with Silverberg and Ellison. Carlin. Listen, you, when, uh, his name is McElroy, is that it? James Elroy, yeah. Elroy. When, when he was, you and he were talking, you said that you had a story about Trevanian that would, quote, knock your socks off. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, let me, t- let me tell you what that... Please. Please. What I what I discovered, and I don't know whether it's true or not, but it was told to me by in strictest confidence by uh, the publisher of uh, Trevanian's last book. If you look at the novels that Trevanian writes, the first two or three, The Iger Sanction and a couple of the others, uh, and then look at Shibumi, there is a very marked difference in the way the books are written and in the style and in the intellectual level. But he also wrote The Main, which is very different. Though. Right, and The Main is different again. Yeah. And I found that very peculiar, and I was talking to the publisher, and I can't remember who it was now, and he said to me, well, you know, Trevanian is a corporate name. It's a, co- it's a collaborative name. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's owned by a consortium, and they've had different writers writing the different books under the name Trevanian. Now, I, I've seen somewhere the name Trevanian, and then they, they list his name, uh, of who he is, and so I have always thought that maybe what I was told was uh, was Codswallop. No, what is his name? John uh, Duffy. No, I, I <laughs> shut up, Silverberg. Uh, I can't remember. And I just saw it the other day uh, in a uh, in a catalog of of, uh, of used books mi- of, of mystery and detective books, and they had the name Trevanian, and then then the uh, the dealer had put the real name of the author, like, as in John Le Carre, which is not his real name, uh, and I forget what his real name is now Cromwell. too. Uh, what? David Cornwell. David Cornwell is uh, Jean Le Carre. Yeah. Uh, and they had another name for Trevanian. It was the first time I had seen... He's the same guy, because Le Carre's books, they, you know, you can tell they're written by the same fellow. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the Le Carre's are. But uh, but the Trevanian books are very different. Yeah, there was a thing this summer of Katya, which is very different than all of them, too. Yeah. yeah every one of the books uh, has a different, it seems to me, a different intellect behind it. Either that or the writer is the most multifarious writer in the world and 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 you you read a writer enough and i've read all the trevanian books because i like them Me too but but i like some of them better than, i mean shibumi was an i uh, like that very the much. best of the <laughs> and it's some of the most elegant writing uh i've ever read and and the other books are not that elegantly written oh well, now i must say that 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 the guy that there was a thing about spelunking cave i, I don't know what you call it like. spelunking yeah uh, uh i'm i'm a, i'm a i'm a caver yeah. And, and I knew a lot of that but stuff. But listen, that was in, you know, it seemed to me, the reason that I said that they might be the same guy was because in Shibumi it has belonging. Also in the Iger Sanction it had, you know, the mountain climbing business. Yeah. And then I think there was also some spelunking going on in one of those things, too. So maybe if what you say is true, they're splitting up the books. In other words, the, the, the part on the mountain climbing and so on may be written by the same guy. You see what I'm saying? Could, could in fact, be. Listen, I've got to move along. So you can't... One thing before you go. Tell yeah. me again where you got this piece of news. I got it from, uh, from the publisher, uh, one, of the, one of the people who worked at the publishing house that published Shibumi. I can't remember what it is now. It's been a number of you years. You think ago. it really is true, and it is a corporation of lawyers, I, of, of writers. Well, I, I, I believed it at the time because it answered the question. It seemed logical. That they that the consortium hired whoever they needed for a particular book at a certain time. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Right. Bye bye. Uh, I'm going to go to line E. Hi there. You're with Silver. Please talk to Silver. He's no, getting no, no, incredibly no. cranky with no, me. I only came down. Certainly, certainly. Nice Harlan, we all know about your wonderful trips down the rabbit hole with your dealings with Hollywood. I was wondering if Robert had had any uh, such dealings himself. There are so many novels of his that I think would make wonderful movies uh, for the less astute, something like The Second Trip, or for a real nice small movie, something like Dying Inside. Uh, has he had any, you know, calls that have come up for movies that have since been aborted or uh, that are in the works at this time? All yeah. right, well, let me ask. Bob, um, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tap you off, but, uh, but we're going to answer the question for you. What's, what's been your thing with Hollywood? Well, a million things have been optioned round and round. Book of Skulls was under option to about seven different people over a 12-year period. Dying Inside was optioned over 20th Century Fox. Uh, More things than I can think of. But of course, none of these ever got made, which is basically the way the system works most of the time. The only thing that's been made is to see The Invisible Man from Twilight Zone when I was there. Yeah, well, I've had... Some movie was made in France, too. I think the second trip was done 
Uh, By the way, were you happy with to see the invisible? Yeah, I thought it was very nicely done, very faithful to the story. Uh, these things get optioned, and periodically I come down and I talk to some Hollywood person. They they call me. I live in Northern California. And they call me and say, "We'd we'd love a script from you. Why don't you come down and talk about this and that?" So I do come down and I talk to some very big people. And then somewhere along the way, they say, "Oh, uh, you haven't done a script before." Uh, well, then we can't use you. And then well, you I should say to them, yeah, but my best friend is Harlan Ellison. I'm sure he'll backstop me. I did this. that once, and I was thrown right through a plate glass window. Plate glass window? Plate glass window, <laughs> yes. It was <laughs> Japanese company, yes. <laughs> uh, plate glass window. Uh, the, the closest anything ever materialized was uh, in 75 when Paramount was getting going on the first Star Trek movie. And... I was indeed hired about the third writer in that sequence and given a lot of money, and then nothing ever happened. And the, the project was aborted when it came back, and I was not any part of it. In fact, nobody was any part of it who had been part of it then. How lucky for all of us that we were not. Well, I would have liked to write that script. I had a really good idea <laughs> for it. But basically, I think of, of Hollywood money as, as pie in the sky, and every now and then a chunk of it falls on my shoe, and I scoop it off and put it in the bank, but I, it's not anything I can depend on. A couple of weeks ago... Uh, uh, I, I, I inter I've been reading some works from Daniel Pinkwater. You know Daniel Manis Pinkwater? Yeah. And I read a couple of his books on the air. And uh, about two days later, I got a call from Ralph Bakshi for a project that he wanted to do, and he wanted me to write it. And the instant he told me about it, I knew that it was not me, that it was Dan Pinkwater. Uh -huh. And so I turned him on to Dan Pinkwater, and he has now made a deal with Daniel Manis Pinkwater. Bakshi and, Man and, and, and D. Manis Pinkwater will be doing something together, uh, profoundly weird and uh, peculiar. Yeah, these, these things happen in a very random way, and I don't try to make them happen. I just <laughs> stay back and watch what's happening. Hi there. Hour 25, what's up? Uh, hi, Robert. Were you with that DC Comics adaption of your short story, Nightmare? Uh, we got a bad line. I'm gonna I'm gonna take you off, but I think I got your question. He's asking about the DC uh, comic graphic novel of Nightwings. Uh, what about it? Well, what about it? How do you feel about it? Well, it was nicely done. Uh, good standard comic book drawing and a very nice adaptation. They just did Demon with a Glass Hand. That's yes, solid. It's uh, selling like crazy. I understand Nightwing sold very well, too. Yeah, These are very handsome, these DC graphic novels. They've done Fred Pohl and Bradbury and you and me and... Julius Schwartz, who was on this program, uh, is the editor. Yeah, apparently they're seven dollar books or something like that, but they seem to do very well. And they sell all over the place. I'm sorry we had to cut that listener off, but the, but the line was so bad we could barely hear you. Let me uh, go to line A. Hi, you're on hour twenty five. Hello. Yes, we're here. Yeah, hi. Um, let me turn on the radio for a second. Yeah, please, <laughs> folks, you must turn off the radio, otherwise you will blow out our eardrums. Uh, I'd like to ask my question, and I will listen to the answer. Uh, this is for. Mr. Silverberg, it seems that like a lot of... You can call him Bunky. Uh, <laughs> uh, Bunky. Hmm. <laughs> a lot of the uh, science fiction now seems to be uh, written by specialists. Um, Gregory Benford, you know, people that like have gone on to like doctoral level in their fields or that kind of thing. And I just wanted to ask uh, if you think this is... I know it's not like a new trend, but and perhaps it's the fact that I'm you know, getting older, but the science fiction I seem to like is done by people who are like further ahead in their field than a generalist who, you know, who is not um, like a doctorate in a certain field or whatever. I just wanted to ask um, about general comments about the future of science fiction and if this particular trend uh, you think will continue as the world we live in gets more complex and all. And uh, wait, 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 let him answer that one. Let him answer that one before you hey, end. Okay, that's it. I think both you guys do great work. Thank you. I'll listen to the answer. Thanks. Okay. I don't think there's much of a trend here. It happens that Greg Benford is a science fiction reader and writer from way back who also happens to be a PhD in physics. And Bob Ford and a couple of other people are writing science fiction that way. But uh, people like Heinlein and Clark and Sturgeon have managed all these years without doctorates. Uh, it's just a matter of your preference, I suppose, uh, rather than a trend. Well, what about Hogan and Niven and Purnell? And Niven doesn't have any degree at all. Niven flunked out of Caltech. Oh, you're not allowed to say that. He will get very upset. He's the one who told me in public. All right, not well, yet caught that bug. 
Never, he seems rather proud of having flunked out of Caltech and then having gone on to be the great success that he is as a science fiction writer. And it's an interesting, bizarre thing. But uh, well, you went, you have a degree. Yeah, I have a degree from you Columbia. Have a degree from Columbia in yeah. what? Literature. Literature, is it? Yes. What was your specialty? Uh, James Elroy's plays and uh, sonnets. You are a snot. <laughs> James Elroy writes a good stick. I want to tell you something. The show that we did with Elroy is one of the best shows I, I, I've done. I enjoyed it enormously. The part that you guys out there couldn't hear because we had that damned, uh, there was a, a, something wrong in the line. There was water in the transmission line or something, and you, and you got static for the last 20 minutes. He was talking about, about his mother having been murdered. In, in almost exactly the same way that the woman, well, not the same way, but, but his mother had been murdered, and then the Black Dahlia case had happened, and he was fascinated by it. He was a fascinating guy, and I, I, I wish we could replay that show for you, but when I got my tape, it, my tape was recorded out of the studio here, and it had the static on it, too. So that, in fact, is lost. But I think I'm going to have Elroy come back next, uh, after the first of the year sometime, because he's a, he's a fascinating dude. Uh, let's go on to the next uh, uh, call. I know that Bob is just burning to talk to you. Hi, you're on hour 25. Aha. Aha. No. Aha yourself. Yeah, well, sorry about that, Mr. Ellison. <laughs> you can call me Sparky. Silverberg. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, you were anxious to get him questions. Uh, lately, I've been finding a lot of science fiction that I've been trying to write seems to be getting more and more specialized in another way. About the same way you run into Barth. His soul sizzle. And I'm wondering what what is going on here because it is really shaking my faith in the writing of SF. I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. Bob, do you know what this no, means? No, it d didn't get through to me. What, what, what is it you're asking us? Okay. <clears throat> Can you do it in ten words? Yes. More of science fiction I keep reading, and I've been reading it for quite a long time, the more it's beginning to look like it's going off into its own private niche and is becoming unreadable at one end and not worth reading at the other. I'm trying to figure out, is there some way out of this because I'm trying to write the... Well, I'll tell you what, name one writer at the one end, uh, the, uh, uh, the impossible to read, and name one writer at the other end, uh, not worth reading. Hmm. Okay. I mean, give us a for instance. We don't know who you're talking about or, or what you're talking about. Well, we'll start with a for instance that impossible. Ah. Uh, let's see. I'm picking out a title here. <laughs> Listen, the worst thing on radio is dead air. I, I don't mean to be rude, but uh, we're going to have to move on, okay? <coughs> okay, I, bye. Okay, man. Bye bye. Take care. Um, hi, you're on hour 25. And they're all written by the same guy. You do know Trevanian? <laughs> yeah. His uh, name's Rod Whitaker, which is on the screen credits for Iger Sanction. And I think he uses it in one of the first two books as a, as a in, you know, in gag. Well, tell, tell me something. Why, I mean, do you, am I crazy, or, or, or are these books very, very different in style, tone, uh, intellectual level, or, 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 or am I reading this into it? Part of it, I think, has to do with the changes he's gone through. He, he wrote the first one. He was a college professor at the University of Texas, you know, after classes and stuff. So it's written in a different, hmm. pers you know, standing. By the way, the name Rod Whitaker is not the name that was on that catalog of books. It was a different name entirely. Well, <laughs> I know he wrote that one, and uh, Shibumi is um, pretty clear to me that it's the same guy. I haven't seen him in several years. Uh, the Catch You, I haven't read, so I can't say on that one, one way or the other. Hmm. And the Maine, he's from Canada, or like the Chicago, Wisconsin, that, you know, that, that section originally, but I think he's from Canada originally. But also his, his age between the books, I think he was like mid 